Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. Hello and welcome to the podcast, everyone. My name is Bree Noble, and I'm excited to be here today with my friend Tiffany Van Boxtel. She has been on the podcast in the past, um, but today we're going to be talking about something pretty specific, which I'm excited about. We're going to be talking about how you as a singer, if you're a singer listening here, um, can take what you have learned as a singer and start helping other people learn to sing. And we'll definitely get into the like, you know, who should do this and who shouldn't do this? You know, what kind of training do you really need in order to do this? Because you don't want to just start teaching people without any kind of knowledge or technique because you could really mess people's voices up. So um, (laughs) we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, But before we get there, I would love to know, Tiffany, I know that you've told your story a bit on the podcast before, but I'd love to hear it from the perspective of um, as a singer, like the kind of training that you got Mm. and then what made you think, okay, I think I can start training other people in voice. Oh, this is, this is really interesting. Hello. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. So I went to school. I wanted to, I went to college to be a high school choir director. That was my, that was my goal. And so I decided to major in vocal performance and music education so that I could be the best teacher I could be, um, because I'm really of the opinion that teachers need to be strong in their craft if they want to teach other people. Because, you know, what is the old saying? Like, if you can't do teach, I like believe the complete opposite. Like, you need to be great saying, at what you by do. By the way, I, I know. I know it's uh, especially in your field. I bet everyone listening is like cringing, like, (laughs) but we had to take a vocal pedagogy class and for performance, actually not for the education for, for vocal performance. And um, the head of the voice department was teaching it. And we had to teach, I guess, a couple of lessons um, with the Academy that was affiliated with the college. And he saw a couple of things. He's like, wow, these ideas that you're doing, they're really, really awesome. Would you like to take an independent study with me and so-and-so as a small group and we'll go further into this? So I said, yeah, okay, that sounds great. And by the time I was ready to apply for a teaching job, I had actually had a lot of so many referrals that I was getting through the academy and through people in the local community that I decided to keep going because I had about 55 students. So oh only I, 55. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> you, that sounds like you're full. They are half hour lessons, but yes, we were full. Um and so I said, wow, I'm already making more money than a teacher. <laughs> I am working less than a teacher, uh, you know, a public school teacher. And I don't have to deal with like bureaucracy or whatever. I can set my own schedule. I was like, let's just roll with this and I can always apply for a public school choral teaching job in the future if I want or if I change my mind. So I just kept rolling with it and the studio has been full ever since. And so I started my program, the Star Singer Green Room for singers so I could serve more singers. And here we are. (laughs) Wow. So you just kind of fell into it in a way because I mean, I had to take vocal pedagogy too. And I was like, no, this is not for me. So you obviously, you know, figured out from those few lessons that it was your, your superpower. Well, one of the things about that, that's really interesting, that might be great to talk about is you go into a vocal pedagogy class, even if you have a music degree, and they just start throwing anatomy at you and throwing these dense, heavy textbooks at you. and. I don't think a lot of teachers are actually getting 
practical application or a simple way to teach singers or express them or it doesn't a lot of those classes don't seem made for the real world and you kind of have to take what you learn and like filter it all through and a lot of it is experience and it, it is interesting because oh you took a vocal pedagogy class so now we expect you to be able to be an awesome voice teacher you know and if you get out there and you're like oh I don't really know what I'm doing you're, I don't think you're alone <laughs> yeah and they just kind of throw you into the deep end and have you start yeah. teaching students and I was just like so afraid I was going to tell them to do the wrong thing or you know do something that was going to hurt their voice yeah yeah I had had a lot of experience teaching karate before so I just tried to do what I know and we worked a lot of, of physical stuff and I just tried to imagine my experiences in the body um, and get feedback from the singer and with that guidance I started to learn more about how to teach singers and started to feel more comfortable but there of course was this you know beginning time period where I was like I don't know if I can do this <laughs> Well, and I think there's with singing too, there's just this power of description that you have to develop because you can't like see what they're, I mean, some things you can see, right? You can see like if they have, they're holding their breathing apparatus correctly and, and you know, if their chest is rising when they're breathing and all those things, but you cannot see what's going on inside. So I remember my right. voice teacher being really good at describing like the feeling or, you know, uh, giving me a visualization of what my mm -hmm. larynx needed to do or whatever. And, and I think that is a, an art as well. Yeah. And there's a lot of different styles. Um, some, I had a teacher who was very scientific. And then I had a teacher who was very much like, pretend like you're shooting spider webs from your hands, you know, very... <laughs> abstract and that worked for me because I learned very kinesthetically like and and that that was helpful so I think there's a lot of different different ways to teach the voice and you're right it is so abstract and doing what you do best and filling in any information or getting help with things that you don't feel comfortable with is super helpful but knowing how you teach best so you know, if you're not into that super science-y jargon stuff, like, I don't think you have to go there. I think you do have to have some background knowledge, but you don't have to be able to recite Richard Miller's The Structure of Singing for verbatim, you know? Um, if, if Which is so funny. We had that conversation that I used that we had that book in our vocal pedagogy class too. And it was, it's, it's a very technical book, right? It's dense. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> It's, it's, it's great, but you know, it's, it's good to be able to kind of take some of those big heady ideas and like filter them down into the practical. Um, and I, I think that is what has been a superpower for me, but I do it more so like in my body and, and that's been really, really helpful. Hmm. So how, like, how can a singer decide, like maybe they have never thought of being a teacher before. They don't know if they have what it takes to be a teacher or like natural skills as a teacher. They've just been singing and they love singing and they love to help other be people become better singers. But how can they decide if like going this direction is a good idea for them? Like what would make them a good fit? Well, I would like to talk about what would make them not a good fit first, if that's start. okay. Um <laughs> So, I mean, if you're, I understand as, you know, artists, we are doing all the things, we're wearing many hats and some things do not make as much money as others. And I do have to tell you, teaching can be low hanging fruit. It can be super easy to make a ton of money teaching. Like, and it's so easy. It's so like, it's, it's just easy. You're like, man, I am, especially right out of college. I was like, geez, I'm getting $25 a half hour. Like, it's $50 an hour. Like I'm right out of college. Like that's amazing. Um, but if you are thinking about doing this just because you think it would be easier money that you want to supplement your income with versus like, if you actually care, because I know there are people out there who are like, yeah, I would. Nope. I do not have the patience for that. I do not want to help other people. 
Um, no, not interested, but you know, I couldn't make a lot of money. Like if that's you, like, just, just don't just please don't. Um, <laughs> but if, if you're kind of like, well, I do like to help other people, you know, and think about your qualities, you know, if you're helpful, if you're empathetic, if you are, you know, have a heart to serve and if you love music and you love nurturing music, but maybe your questions are more like, I've never really taught a voice lesson before, or I don't even play piano, or I don't know what repertoire I would use, or I don't know any technical exercises. All I really know is like the stuff I did in choir. You know, if that's you and you're thinking more of the the how pieces rather than the big picture, um, if the big picture is yes, and now you're into, well, how would I actually do that? then I think you're a good fit to begin to start learning. Yeah, I like that. It's like, if your why is in line, then we can figure out the how. Oh yeah, I love that. <laughs> it's perfect. And I want, I know that you've, we've talked on previous podcasts about the kind of the responsibility of a voice teacher and how you are taking on a big responsibility training someone's voice. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because people might be a little bit nervous about that. Yes. And remember that teaching, singing, teaching, singing, but teaching and singing are two different skills. So, <laughs> so we can develop, we can develop as teachers, right? We can develop as singers and that is totally fine. So I would like you to think about this. When I'm helping teachers teach, we are talking about symptoms, causes, problems, and solutions. So the symptoms are the things that pretty much anyone would know, like you're singing out of tune, like even a musician, even a non-musician would probably be able to identify that, right? So what happens a lot of times, especially when I work with adult singers and you as a singer might identify with this as well. Is there something that somebody told you a long time ago that has kind of stuck with you? Like, oh, I'm a nasally singer or, oh, my singing is a bit too bright. I need to add some more depth to it. Or, oh, I'm an alto. I can only sing low. Things like that. Those are symptoms. So when I'm working with teachers, I ask them, not to identify the symptoms because the challenge is if you are unable to solve the problem and give them a solution that works for them as singers in a body with our voice being connected into our body we're going to start to identify so instead of the problem being so if the symptom is oh you sound nasally the problem is oh well maybe they don't know how to control the soft palate and the cause might be oh, well, they've never even thought about it or they've never had to do it. Or maybe they're scared to sing higher. They're scared to sing in that range, you know, where they need to do that. Well, then a solution might be a specific type of vocal exercise or a specific type of movement. So if we can go through that process in our mind as teachers and just offer solutions, then when the singer gets success, it's like, yes, they're feeling more confident instead of, oh, I'm a nasally singer. My teacher didn't solve the problem. I'm an easily singer. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of like, until you know how to solve the problem, don't say anything, just problem solve because we can take that feedback so personally. And I think a lot of teachers are really concerned about hurting the voice. And I don't think that's, I mean, it's a big deal. But if you're aware of it and you're considering it, you're probably not going to lead someone astray. But when it comes to the mindset behind singing, I think that's a little bit more vulnerable. And it can be very, very easy, especially if you're a teacher who doesn't have a lot of experience, or maybe you're a teacher, I see this a lot too, teachers with egos, you know, you don't want to admit you're wrong, you don't want to admit that you don't have the right solution, um, or maybe you just don't have the solution yet, or maybe you don't have the training you need, that's okay, you're not alone if that's you. But I would encourage you to just be aware of what you're saying and how the singer might identify with that. And 
if you're aware of the things that you say and think about like how you want to be, it's like the golden rule. How would you want to be treated? You're going to be just fine. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And and I think it, like you said, the ego, and it's important to keep yourself in check, even in like offhanded comments. Sometimes we can remember offhanded comments so much longer than anything specific someone said to us because it was just, you know, it like you said, it was someone where somebody said like, oh, you're such a, you're, you're a nasal singer or blah, blah, blah. And like someone might've said that in an offhanded comment and now they've labeled themselves as that. And it's right. a whole host of problems because of it, because they've got this in their head, right? And um, it's, it's, you know, derailing their confidence and stuff like that. How much of exactly. being a voice teacher has to do with building up the confidence of the singer? That's like pretty much my whole job. <laughs> that's what like... I thought you were going to say. <laughs> <laughs> like technique, that's like, we get to that eventually. But, you know, if we talk about confidence, all it's true though, because if you're not confident, you will do wrong things. I know I will. Like if I'm sight reading, for example, I sing terribly because I'm not confident in the note I'm going to sing. And, you know, and then I just, I'm in pain afterward mm. because I haven't been singing correctly because I'm not confident of where I'm going and, and all those things. Right. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I mean, we want to, what is it like in relationships or like, you know, with your husbands or whatever you, with the old advice of like, make them think it's their idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very similar in a voice teacher and student relationship. Like if you can solve the problem in your head and then offer them a solution and maybe it's a more technical solution, they're doing an exercise and they're like, wow, well, I actually am sounding better. You know, I think that's going to be really helpful because yes, positivity is important. Yes. Encouragement is super necessary. But I think a lot of that confidence, remember, is going to come from what the singer thinks of themselves. So if they can discover improvement for themselves along with you encouraging them, because they might be thinking, oh, yeah, she's just blowing smoke or she's just being nice. Like, I really don't sound that great. But if they're actually singing and they're like, wow, that sounds better, that feels better they're going to be a lot more confident. So there's different ways to build confidence. You know, you can build their confidence in themselves and, you know, you can also help by your own encouragement. Definitely. So let's talk about the business side, because you mentioned at the beginning, you know, wow, you were like, oh my gosh, I just fell into like a really great paying job right out of college. Um, yeah. But then at one point you realized, oh, um, you know, I'm, I'm trading time for money and all of that or um, your studio was full. And so you decided to expand into the green room. Obviously, you know, people that are starting out, they can't do that yet. But um, mm -hmm. what do you have to tell them about, you know, learning the business and money side as a teacher upfront? So that's one of the things that we're going through in the program. Um, and we're going to talk about and actually, you know, I'm working with a a uh, founding member group right now. And I didn't realize that it was such a huge part of it because I've been doing this for <laughs> a long time. Become intuitive um, for you. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It becomes, it becomes very natural. Like this is my job. And I think a big challenge is when you're just like starting out and you have like three singers that you're working with. And you might not consider it to be your full-time job yet or, or whatever. In that instance, and this is going to be like a double whammy for you. Because if you were teaching 55 singers, you'd be like, well, man, I have to hold my boundaries. I have to have strong policies and procedures. There's just not enough time to go around. But when you have three singers that you're working with, you're like, oh yeah, I could do a makeup lesson or, oh yeah, no problem. I could move you or, oh yeah, I could schedule one person on Monday at 11 and one person Monday at two and break up my day and be all awkward. Um, yeah, I'll do that for you. I highly recommend to have really strong policies and procedures straight away because it is going to be so much simpler because remember, this is your time. And you deserve to get paid for your time. Yeah, de definitely get paid 
Um, I don't, I don't know what you, if you want to go with the time route or the money route or the boundary route or what do you want? Um, I think probably the biggest thing that I hear from, from teachers of singers Mm -hmm. that they don't have a good system in place. So they're being paid like they have a regular recurring income versus like ah. one off lesson payments. Okay, pro tip. Never charge weekly ever. <laughs> I would like you to write this down. Never charge weekly. Monthly? Cool. Bi-monthly? Awesome. Bi-monthly is actually you probably know this. Bi-monthly means two different things, so that's confusing. So yeah. I call it a session. <laughs> ah. So my my session is 2 months. Um, some people do quarterly, but my two month session works just great. But if you're not comfortable with that, at least go for monthly. And here's why that is helpful for your student. Okay. Because it's interesting. A lot of people, you give where you don't need to give. For example, I think that when you're giving feedback, You need to be very empathetic and aware of what you say. But when we're dealing with the business side of things, I think you can be a little bit more selfish. And that is not at a disadvantage to your student. Because if you're charging monthly, you can collect that payment up front, which means you can be more focused in your lessons and you don't have to think, oh my gosh, is Susie gonna pay me at the end of the lesson? I don't know. Um, am I actually going to get paid? Like you'll be, you'll be think because they forgot, you know, they always forget. Um, I'm probably not going to get paid for this, you know, and now your brain is like somewhere else instead of focusing on the student. Um, when they pay monthly, they lock in their lesson time. So they know they're going to be there. You're going to be there. Um, consistency is very important. You know, if someone was booking a lesson each week, they're not going to be as consistent and they're not going to get the best results. So remember a lot of your boundaries and a lot of your choices around policies and procedures are not like, I'm trying to think about a way to say this that's appropriate. Um, They're not being like hard and super You're not firm. being a hard ass. Like you're trying to yes. help them at the same time, right? You, you're trying to yes. give them a level of accountability while also making yourself feel like, like you said, you've got this, you know, consistency going on where you don't have to be thinking about that all the time. Yes. And you can I focus know. on the student. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. So that I, I didn't know what your settings were on your podcast and like what that, so <laughs> I don't want to ruin it for you, but yeah, you don't want to, you don't, you're not being a hard ass. You are being firm. You are setting clear expectations. And that's another thing too. People just want to know, like when they ask you questions, like how much do you charge or well, okay, how does it work? They're not asking you to justify your price. Mm -hmm. They're just saying, how much is this? I would like to pay you. (laughs) And that can be hard if you're not feeling confident on the teaching end of things yet. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And that's, that's why they need your program. So I would love to have you talk a little bit about, since you have been running a founder's version of your program, um, what, you know, what have you learned in this experience and what kind of people, um, where were people at when they came to the program and what kind of progress have you seen? Yeah, we just started um, the end of July. And so that was really exciting. Um, We had It's interesting because in this group of people, most people are educators of some sort, but maybe haven't gone the route of teaching voice. Um, Some of them have taught a different instrument. They want to, you know, add voice lessons. That's another thing too. Finding a good voice teacher can be very challenging. So especially, and I mean, I'm in Nina, Wisconsin right now. It is not small. I would say there's 35,000 people here. And then in the, you know, surrounding cities, there's probably about 250,000 people. So it's not like super rural, but there aren't as many voice teachers as piano teachers. That's what I'm trying to say. There just aren't. So if you can offer voice lessons, it's so easy for you to be able to get referrals if you are 
a good teacher and you're caring about your students. So the people who are good fit for this program are singers, and it's more about the personality and having a heart to serve. As Bree said, we can figure out the how if your why is aligned. I'm not sure if that answered the full question. <laughs> yeah, no, it's cool to know that a lot of them are currently, they're kind of like you, right? They went, you went to school to become a choir director, but you decided to not go that route. Mm -hmm. Are any of them singers that don't have any teaching experience that want to be able to help others because they got such a great break for, through with their own voice? And if not, do you think those people are a good fit? Yeah, um, a lot of them are singers. In fact, they all identify with being a singer and they're, they're feeling comfortable and confident with their singing. Oh, I, oh, there we go. Thank you, Brie. So there it is, there it is. I want you to at least feel pretty comfortable and confident with your own singing. And this doesn't mean like, oh my gosh, I'm always feeling 100% confident when I step into a recording studio or don't get nervous, like I've got this, you know? This just means, hey, I feel pretty comfortable and confident I've trained my own singing for a long time. I feel like I'm in control of my voice. And because if you're not in a place where you feel comfortable and confident with your own singing, at least the majority of the time, it's going to be really difficult to serve other people because you will have to do things like vocal modeling and being comfortable demonstrating and, and showing your voice. And the more comfortable that you can be, the better you're going to serve your student anyway. For sure. Do you think that voice teachers need to be able to show that they've done certain things in their own singing career? Like, do they need to be like, oh, I was in this musical and I was on, you know, I performed in, at these locations or I got this, you know, award or whatever, or do you think that doesn't matter? Oh yeah, absolutely not. I mean, I don't, that might be like a weird opinion. Um, but I don't think that you have to. I've never, I've had like one person ask what my degree was ever. See, that's good to know. Cause I think like, some people talk themselves out of it because of, they don't have those things. Yeah. Um, I think it is more important that you have a heart to serve and you are continuing to work on yourself as a teacher, as a singer, continuing to learn more, continuing to better your craft. Um, degrees, accolades, they're, they're not really that important, you know, and this is my certification program. I mean, you will get a certificate when you're done, but it's not like the important part is that you feel comfortable and confident mm -hmm. when you're done. It's like not something tangible that you walk away with per se. It's, it's a feeling. It's like being able to create yourself to run your own business, run your own voice teacher, make a bigger impact with the singers that you're working with and just walk away feeling like that. So a lot of accolades and degrees, and I mean, they're important, but when you think about what they represent, it's, it's usually more of who you are as a person today and what you've walked away with from the knowledge that you've learned. That's right. It's basically just a signifier of the journey that you were on. Um, I did want to add, before we get into it, I'd love to have you tell them how they can uh, get more information about your program. But before we do that, I would love to ask about online teaching, because I know you came on the podcast and you talked specifically about how to transition people to online back in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, how are you finding this working now where we're kind of like up and down with the pandemic? And are you teaching your students to kind of weave that into their options as far as what they offer students? Maybe they, you know, do a hybrid program um, or they offer that like if a student has paid for a lesson, but they can't get there for whatever reason, they can do online. Like, how do you work that in? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is that's part of the program we're talking about teaching online or talking about teaching in person, you know, it is nice to gain some experience from teaching in person. You can see the whole body, um, you can experience that. But honestly, teaching online is not that much different. Sometimes, you know, you have to say, oh, hey, to turn up the volume or turn down the volume or step back or step forward. But other than that, it's 
it is still teaching at the heart of it. And we are going through also the systems and the processes to make that easy on the business end. Um, we have a couple of people who are deciding to teach online exclusively mm. um, simply because, well, there are a lot of benefits to that. I mean, the world is your oyster and you can just find the people who are a great fit because it doesn't really matter where they're located if you can find a time zone that fits for you. Um, that also might be a way to charge significantly higher prices or, or at least just a little bit what you feel is fair um, because the range of prices for voice lessons is crazy pants. I've seen it go from $15 a half an hour to like 150. Wow. Um, but usually in, I don't know, I don't believe in our lessons until you're more like pretty advanced, but you know, you see like $300 an hour, like you'll, you'll definitely see that in some of the bigger cities. Are they worth that? Probably not. Um, but <laughs> well, you know, and, and, and you can compete with them, you know, yes. you could charge much lower than that and still yes. get, make more than you probably could in your local market. If you live in, you know, some smaller market. And, exactly. Thank and you. Have, you know, have <laughs> access to those people that like they, and for them, they have access to you. They can't afford people. And you know, if they're in New York city, right. They probably yeah. have a lot of high priced people there. Oh yeah. Um, and they could access someone that was just as good, honestly. Right. But is yeah. in a different market. Exactly. Yeah. And you, you know, it doesn't have to be, it can still be a price that feels good to you, but that's, that's really great. And I'm here in Wisconsin. So sometimes it snows and it's <laughs> bad travel conditions, you know? And so even some of the local students, I mean, they can just send me a text and be like, Hey, I'd like to be online tonight. And I'm like, okay, cool. And they already are set up with their, their online link and all of that. And a lot of people in the certification program are doing different. We've got one woman who wants to start local and then choose from there. Um, some people are choosing to be exclusive online. Um, others will accommodate uh, whatever the student wants. So there definitely are a lot of options. I love it. And because of the pandemic, I think out of necessity, we've had to build that in. But now I think it's actually even more convenient for you mm. and the student as well. So I love that. Yeah. You can just text you and be like, ah, you know, our car broke down or whatever, you know, can I do yep. it online? Yep. Well, and even, you know, teenagers, older teenagers too. I mean, sometimes they're, they're just old enough where they can't drive and mom and dad have a conflict and they're like, I can't get there. Like I want to be online tonight. I'm like, okay, cool. So it, it definitely does give a lot of options and it adds some variety to your life too, because, you know, having a little bit of both variety is always good. It has a, it has a slightly different feel, the online lesson versus the live lesson. They're both good. Yeah. It's I agree. Nice variety breaks it up that. too for the teacher. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, this is all so awesome. I think by listening to what we've said so far, people should know if they are a good fit for this program or not. Um, and I, I highly recommend it to you guys. I have known Tiffany for potentially three years now. Um, and many of my <laughs> students have been in her star singer green room and I totally trust her as far as her technique. So let them know, how can they fill out an application? I know that you have different rounds. So like if they miss the round, um, you can fill out the application anyway, and, and she can let you know when the next round is. Yeah, definitely. So this program is called the Van Box the Voice Method Certification Program. It's going to be focused a lot on what we talked about before, symptoms, cause, problems, and solutions. It's going to be very community-centered, very feedback-centered. You're actually going to get practical feedback um, from real-time teaching. Mm. And so that is going to be really, really awesome. If you feel like you're a good fit, you can go to starsinger.co slash apply. Um, you can fill out an application if you're a good fit. Um, I'll contact you and you can hop on a 30 minute call with me. Um, filling out the application and hopping on the call does not obligate you to join the program. I would love to just chat with you, see where you're at, offer some business advice, offer some teaching advice, and then you can ask any questions to see if you are a good fit for the program on this call. And applications are due 
by September 15th, 2021. Right, for this round. But again, if you see this later, oh. just go ahead and apply. And and I'm sure she'll open new rounds because this is going to be your second round already. So um, again, that's starsinger.co, not com, starsinger.co slash apply. And I cannot wait. I know one of my students right now in my academy is going through her, her founding members group, and I can't wait to hear from her how it's going. So uh, thank you so much, Tiffany. This has been awesome. I think you've really given clarity to people that may have been tossing around the idea of teaching voice. I know I went through a period when I my kids you know, got to the age where they were school age, and I was like, what am I going to do? Uh, it was right before I started all the stuff I do now with Profitable Musician, but I really did consider being a voice teacher and I tossed around the idea. And had you been around back then, maybe I would have joined your program and now I'd be a voice teacher and not be running this program, but um, you never know. So people come to those kind of crossroads in their lives. And if that's you guys who are listening, definitely have a conversation with Tiffany and see if it's a good fit for you. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.